Lisa promises that if I, I um, drone on too long with too many slides, she's going to give me a yank to make sure there's enough time left over for questions, because that usually is the best part. I'm so happy to be back. And, and we were discussing, I think this is our fourth or fifth time uh, I've had the pleasure of, of uh, speaking at force meetings. And, but this is the first time I had to leave my own state to, um, to uh, address this great group. Uh, and it's nice to see how much force has grown. Uh, it's gets spectacular. Okay, so um, I'm looking at an audience where the great majority of you would fit into the category of either um, previvors or survivors. And among the previvors in the room, um, many of you are premenopausal. Um, some of you have had a spontaneous menopause, a menopause not not um, hastened by surgery or chemotherapy, for instance. Um, uh, among previvors, some of you have had risk reducing GYN surgery, which would include, at a minimum, bilateral salpingophorectomy, um, removal of tubes and ovaries, or BSO, uh, and with or without removal of the uterus hysterectomy. And some of you have had risk reducing breast surgery. And, um, and then some of you are breast or, um, and or ovarian cancer survivors. And then there's also some fine gentlemen in the room too, I noticed. Okay, um, I'd like to, over the next 30 or 40 minutes or so, um, present an evidence-based perspective um, on menopause and the use of hormone therapy, not for the BRCA community, but for women in general. Um, we'd like to also focus on the consequences of menopause particularly induced menopause in terms of hot flashes or vasomotor symptoms, um, cogn cognition concerns, genital atrophy or vulvovaginal atrophy issues, as well as loss of sexual desire. And then I'd like to conclude by focusing on treatment of these issues with a specific focus on the um, BRCA, the BRCA community and previvors, as well as survivors. Uh, a lot of alphabet soup with abbreviations, and I hope I won't be confusing here. Um, okay, so uh, I was at lunch uh, with some um, um, several previvors um, earlier downstairs, and uh, we were talking about how did I get involved in speaking for force, and this is how I got involved. This was about 10, 12 years ago. A woman in her 30s came to see me with this history, um, and I've, I've changed her profession to protect her identity, um, and um, she was very bothered after her risk-reducing GYN surgery by hot flashes, sleep, sleep challenges, painful sex, vaginal dryness, um, reduced sexual desire, but interestingly, her biggest complaint was that she had lost the, her sharpness, her cognitive she wasn't, she was feeling a little bit in a cloud, and that was a big, big concern to this high-functioning woman. Her OBGYN, who had delivered her babies and had performed her GYN surgery, was unwilling to prescribe hormone therapy, and, that, and it is in that context that I met her. So, um, it and it also turns out that she's a, um, a close friend of Sue Friedman. So, um, so here I am. Okay, so... Uh, let's start by defining menopause and what we mean by na uh, natural versus um, induced uh, menopause. So in, um, in healthy, non-smoking women, um, women become menopausal usually in their early 50s. And menopause refers to the decline or almost actually cessation of ovarian production of, of two hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Turns out that um, although menopausal women's ovaries also make less testosterone, that decline starts much earlier. That actually starts in women in their 30s. Whereas there's, there's an, and there's a gradual reduction in ovarian production of testosterone over years and decades um, that continues with menopause, but there's no abrupt decline in testosterone at the time of menopause. Bless you, there is a, a fairly abrupt decline in ovarian production of est estrogen, specifically estradiol, and progesterone at the time of menopause. Now, of course, in, in women with induced, or particularly relevant to this group, um, surgically induced menopause, there's abrupt declines in all three ovarian hormones when ovaries are removed. 
But um, I know this is, uh, might seem patronizing to this well-informed group, but a lot of my patients don't recognize that menopause is not a uterine event. It actually has nothing to do with the cessation of menstruation. It, ha it has to do with the cessation of ovarian production of, of these hormones, um, specifically estrogen and progesterone. Okay. So let's, let's talk about the importance of or the role of estrogen. And we're, we're going to talk both about systemic and then later also we'll be talking about local or, or vaginal low-dose estrogen. But here we'll talk about systemic estrogen, whether it be oral, transdermal, and transdermal in general means patch, but there are gels and sprays and other transdermal formulations. There's also a systemic vaginal ring uh, and the brand name is Femring, and I use that brand name because that should not be confused with Estring, which is um, a similar looking ring, and they're both three month rings, but Estring only has enough estrogen to treat local vaginal symptoms, VVA, whereas Femring has enough um, estrogen, as with patches or oral tablets, to treat bothersome hot flashes, related symptoms, prevent osteoporosis, including fractures, um, and if there are cognitive benefits, um, um, to uh, bring about those cognitive benefits too. And, and if, if there are cognitive benefits of estrogen, we'll, and we'll, we have a couple of slides on this later, it's, they're probably not so relevant to spontaneously menopausal women, and they're definitely not relevant to older women, women in their 60s and beyond who may already be starting to experience some cognitive issues. If there are cognitive benefits of estrogen, they are most relevant to, um, to the women in this room, um, women who may be experiencing uh, early induced menopause. And I think that's my, my patient um, uh, who I, uh, we referred to earlier, I think was a great example of that. Um, okay. Um, systemic estrogen does prevent as well as treat vulvovaginal atrophy, but the caveat there is that if the only reason to consider using estrogen is vulvovaginal atrophy, and there are no hot flash concerns or um, skeletal health osteoporosis concerns, then, then it makes more sense to use local low-dose vaginal estrogen and not systemic estrogen. You, you, why, why treat parts of the body that, don't, that aren't causing problems? Focus on what does need to be treated. Oh, and um, we'll go over this again, but the local vaginal estrogen includes two types of creams, one low-dose slow-release tablet, and then I mentioned that three-month low-dose estrin. Okay. Turning now to progesterone, it's available in oral formulations. Um, it's, there are some synthetic progestins are available combined with estrogen in patch formulations. There is injectable. There's also intrauterine, uh, as in intrauterine device, uh, releasing progestins. And there's also vaginal progesterone. And, the main reason, pretty much the only reason to use progesterone in menopausal practice is in women with a uterus. Um, and if women with a uterus are taking estrogen to treat menopausal symptoms, and many of you are well aware of this, um, that estrogen, if there's an intact uterus, will cause proliferation of the endometrial lining, the uterine lining, which can lead to bleeding, precancerous or even cancerous changes. Progesterone prevents that. Okay. Uh, so um, it would be rare, uh, if ever, that I would be prescribing progesterone to a menopausal woman post-hysterectomy, right? Okay. We'll talk about testosterone and sexuality issues going forward. Okay. Um, in my community, but I imagine in yours as well, um, Droves of women, some men too, but particularly women are being, um, they're responding to Mark, you're in, in Arizona too? Okay. Alisa says, um, uh, so it's, it's a national phenomena that um, pharmacists and physicians are setting up hormone clinics where they market like crazy and, um, um, and they sell um, so-called custom compounded hormones, which in fact are not FDA approved, to unsuspecting, and I will add, cash-paying women. Um, uh, insurance usually doesn't cover this, and nor, nor should it cover this treatment. Um, 
and um, uh, after the Food and Drug Administration, American College OBGYN, North American Menopause Society, or NAMS, which I'm very uh, involved with, uh, all, all of these groups um, uh, have issued um, guidance that uh, they don't recommend custom compounded hormone therapy, and yet these, um, uh, when people ask me, I say, well, they're much better at marketing than I am, and that's, that's certainly true. I mean, I'm, I'm a real amateur at, at marketing compared to um, these custom, these compounding people. And I also emphasize to my patients that I don't sell medications to my patients, um, and I hope your physicians, clinicians, don't sell medications to you. I hope they sell their expertise to you and nothing else, um, perhaps along with some compassion, um, I hope. Um, um, but um, these custom compounders are selling product to patients in um, uh, I would say I have a lot of ethical concerns, as do others, about that practice. Um, they also sell testing services, um, including salivary and extensive blood work. Um, and that's really confusing to my patients. It may be confusing to you, too. Um, how do you determine if you need a statin for cholesterol problems? Well, you, your internist perhaps does blood tests. How do you determine if you need thyroid uh, medication? Well, blood tests. But in fact, in menopausal medicine, it's symptoms and patient history and not blood work that, that determines whether or not hormone therapy is appropriate. And that, that sounds like it doesn't make sense, but in fact, um, clinically, we understand that to be the case. Um, so FSH and LH and estradiol levels, uh, I sometimes order those in my patients who are candidates for hormone therapy or taking hormone therapy, but not very often. There's very little need. And salivary testing is not useful at all. It, it doesn't measure systemic or serum levels of hormones, but it's very profitable to those clinicians who order those tests. Um, those of you who want, would like to learn more about custom compounders um, and the pitfalls of this, um, are, I would refer to um, More Magazine, and I have the website there. There's a really excellent article in, published in uh, last October. Okay, let's, let's start talking about the best evidence, um, looking at the risks and benefits of hormone therapy, and that would take us to Women's Health Initiative. Um, uh, and many of you may be aware, Women's Health Initiative was perhaps the largest clinical trial ever sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, I, I was a WHI, I ran the, the, the clinical site in Jacksonville for almost a decade in the 90s. Um, and although there are many components of WHI, the most prominent ones and the most, most relevant right now were the hormone clinical trials. And these were randomized, blinded trials where about uh, 15,000 women were um, age 50 to 70 were randomized to estrogen, progestin versus placebo. So all of those women had what organ intact? Estrogen, progestin versus placebo. All of them had a uterus, right. And then there were about 9,000 women, also 50 to 70 randomized to estrogen versus placebo, and those women all had had hysterectomy, right. The first findings came out about 12 years ago in the summer of, of 02, uh, and terrified women and also physicians about the safety of hormone therapy. Um, you see that zombie-like woman on the cover of Newsweek. Um, I guess that's, that's dating my talk. We, uh, Newsweek's not even around anymore, is it? Okay. Um, and literally millions of women in this country, and in fact worldwide, stopped hormone therapy. A lot of my patients flushed their tablets down the toilet. Um, some of them came back to me um, a few months later. Uh, um, what do I do about my symptoms now? Um, but this was a, a huge event in the menopausal world, and there was a lot of fear. But I want to sort of go beyond that initial 2002 data and, and talk about what our current perspective is, because it's, it's associated, I believe, with much less fear than, um, than 12 years ago. Okay. And so I'd like to fast forward right to an, um, a paper from um, my colleague, Yoan Manson, and other WHI investigators looking at 13-year follow-up of these same women in the, um, so EPT, um, estrogen and progestin therapy, or versus placebo, women with an intact uterus, and ET, post-hysterectomy. Okay, 
So just a couple broad brush, broad brush observations. Mortality 13 years later was no different in women randomized to hormones versus placebo. So there's, there is no cataclysmic health benefit or risk. Um, mortality unchanged at, more than a decade later. Um, in terms of a persistent uh, elevation in risk, persistent elevation in risk of uh, invasive breast cancer in women randomized to estrogen progestin versus placebo. What, what does a relative risk of 1.28 or 1.3 mean? Hmm. Um, so the relative risk of lung cancer with smoking, anyone know? It's, it's 10 to 15. Um, uh, the relative risk of having a glass or two of Chardonnay uh, several nights a week with dinner, what, what is that for menopausal women? What's their, how does that impact women's risk of breast cancer and to what degree? I tell my patients, I'll probably be having wine or beer tonight, and you, perhaps you will be too. What's the impact on breast cancer risk? It's about a relative risk um, of 1.4, 1.5. Um, also, there's um, a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. So health-wise, perhaps it's a, it's a wash. But these, this is a real risk. It is not to be trivialized. Uh, it's also not to be exaggerated. This is not a major elevation of risk. And that probably for this group would be the most worrisome impact of hormone therapy. Let's turn now to estrogen therapy in the, in the women without a uterus. Uh, again, no, no long-term impact on mortality at all. And a persistent reduced risk, and I'm gonna repeat that because it sounds counterintuitive, a persistent reduced risk of being diagnosed with invasive breast cancer and also a reduced risk of mortality from breast cancer. How many, how many of your friends are aware of that difference between EPT and ET? Um, probably not too many. How many of my colleagues, uh, particularly if they're not actively involved in taking care of menopausal women, are aware of this? Not too many, and yet it is very well documented. This is not controversial. This is uh, very clear, because the largest study um, conducted, the best quality study conducted, has clarified these findings. Okay. And there may be questions about this. Now, I, that, that was in women overall, women age 50 to 70 at the time of enrollment, the time they were um, randomized to placebo versus hormone therapy. But we, I, I don't put 65-year-old women, I don't see 65-year-old or 60-year-old women coming into my office saying, Dr. Kaunitz, what, what can you do about my bothersome hot flashes? But I see a lot of women in, who are 50 or 55 coming to me with menopausal symptoms and for treatment. So what about this, what I call clinically relevant group? Looking at women in their 50s, or what I like to refer as, to as young menopausal women, young menopausal women, that's, that's um, not an oxymoron, not in my practice at least. Um, so what's the health impact of hormone therapy, whether estrogen alone or EPT in young menopausal women? Turns out quite favorable. Um, Reduc reduced risk of coronary heart disease, including myocardial infarction. Overall reduction in cancer risk. Reduced all-cause mortality uh, that, that um, um, was not sufficient to achieve statistical significance, but there was a reduced risk. And then, and that's estrogen therapy. For, for women with an intact uterus, reduced all-cause mortality, but again, not achieving statistical significance. This is not a worrisome health profile, um, um, and, and yet Women's Health Initiative has um, generated a lot of anxiety, a lot of concern, but because it enrolled a lot of women way out of the age profile where we'd be starting hormone therapy in clinical practice, it's caused a lot of confusion and a lot of unnecessary anxiety. And I think overall, the impression I'd like you to leave to leave you with is that the best available evidence, which I've just reviewed, um, no, there's no other large randomized trials of hormone therapy, um, clarified that in the clinically relevant group, or I like to use the term again, young menopausal women, for, um, for many women, um, there's a very favorable benefit risk profile to hormone therapy, particularly for symptomatic menopausal women. And again, we're talking about women overall, not previvors specifically here. Um, with 
This with um, some time, 12 years have elapsed since that, that, those scary 2002 headlines. I would like to think and I'd like to project to you that the pendulum is swinging in terms of how we perceive benefits and risk of hormone therapy. And I have about five slides that I guess summarize a message, messages I'd like to leave you with in terms of hormone therapy for women overall. Uh, hormone therapy is safe for recently or younger menopausal women. Uh, in general, there, there's clearly exceptions, but in general, it is safe in this group. It is our most effective treatment for hot flashes, although we will soon talk, in a few minutes, I'll talk about non-hormonal management of hot flashes, which is important, particularly in survivors. Uh, hormone therapy clearly is also effective for fracture prevention and for treatment of genital atrophy. But, guess, but if, if the only indication for hormone therapy is genital atrophy, then what's our preference? Local, local vaginal therapy, thank you, okay. All right, so in terms of estrogen progestin therapy, intact uterus, and when younger menopausal women start hormone therapy, it is safe from a cardiovascular perspective. When older menopausal women start hormone therapy, there are elevated risks. Uh, in general, I would suggest, um, when I'm talking to my colleagues, not starting older women on hormone therapy, women in their 60s or 70s, but in fact, that, that ends up not being that clinically relevant because the women we see are for, for symptoms are younger in general. Okay, um, again, what about estrogen progestin therapy in breast cancer? And the, this is just a review. With long-term use, not with short-term use, but with long-term use, modest elevated risk, an elevation less than 1.3. Uh, it does increase, however, with long-term use. And it does seem, as I guess reviewed with the 13-year follow-up data, to persist even after stopping hormone therapy. A, a dramatic elevation in risk? No. A real elevation in risk for women with a uterus who are taking EPT? Yes, I believe. And so uh, it's not something that we should trivialize. Okay. Um, I, I guess as a review, things change when we're talking about women without a uterus. Um, pers persistent reduction in risk of and mortality from invasive breast cancer, no elevation in coronary heart disease um, when younger menopausal women start ET. However, oral um, estrogen therapy with or without progestin does increase the risk of blood clot and stroke, the, the risk being more prominent with blood clot. By the way, what other oral estrogen taken by millions of younger women increases the risk of blood clot? birth control pills, it's, it's really about the same phenomenon. So it's not a big surprise. However, what we now have five um, studies indicating that patch estrogen, which was not studied by Women's Health Initiative, um, is just as effective in treating hot flashes, preventing osteoporosis, but seems to have no impact on uh, the risk of thrombosis. So in general, but particularly in high-risk women, um, um, my, pra my practice, I would say probably th at least three quarters of my patients who start on hormone therapy, let's say for hot flashes, would start on patch rather than oral hormone therapy. However, some patients prefer oral hormone therapy and it's, much l and it's less expensive too. You can get um, uh, micronized oral estradiol for $4 a month uh, at, at Walmart and most chain stores, which is a hard price to beat. So which women are at highest risk for thrombosis at baseline? And you can tell when they, um, you can look in the waiting area and identify these patients. Who are the patients who, because of baseline risk factors, have a higher risk for, um, for, for blood clot? And I'm afraid if I was a menopausal woman, I might qualify for the, being in this group. Elevated BMI. Obese women, right. So obesity is a major risk factor for thrombosis. So if I have an obese patient with bothersome hot flashes, and hot flashes, by the way, are more prevalent in obese women who are menopausal, I would strongly encourage them not to use oral, but rather to use transdermal because their, their risk of um, VTE with two risk factors, oral estrogen and high, BM, high body mass index would be substantial. I'd rather uh, reduce that risk by using patch. Okay, 
And then as we've reviewed several times, um, uh, women whose only indication for hormone therapy is our genital or, or vaginal dryness and other related symptoms, we prefer local vaginal to systemic treatment. Let's move a little bit away from hormones and talk for a few minutes about selective estrogen receptor modulators or SERMs. Okay, so we've, you, you're familiar with the data in the first bullet. We've discussed that. We've discussed the data in the second bullet. But um, I think most of you in this room are aware that, um, that the two um, classic time-honored SERMs used in US women are tamoxifen and riloxifen. And these can, are, are approved by the FDA to prevent breast cancer, which is sometimes called chemoprophylaxis, in women found to be at elevated risk. And this, um, we didn't know too much about previvors, whether tamoxifen was helpful in preventing breast cancer in previvors. We have recent data indicating it is, just as it is in women in general. Um, tamoxifen is most widely used, though, as adjuvant therapy. And um, uh, tamoxifen, perhaps more than any other uh, agent, has been responsible um, for the reduction, the very gratifying reduction in overall mortality from invasive breast cancer that we've seen in the last 15 years. Okay, so it's, it's made a huge, it's been a huge benefit. So those are the two older SERMs. Let's talk about something, a new SERM. Uh, we'll actually talk about two new SERMs, both of which are now marketed. So you've heard of conjugated equine estrogen or Premarin. By the way, what is, what is Premarin an abbreviation for? Premarin, I think, I think that brand name's been around since the 1930s. So who knows what pregnant, um, and no, I do not volunteer that information to my patients unless they ask, but, but you're absolutely correct. Mostly, mostly the horses from Saskatchewan who are ethically cared for and, they're, um, and during pregnancy, their urine's retrieved uh, um, and hormones are extracted and that becomes Premarin. Um, Premarin and Progestin uh, was in combination form, or Premarin alone, were the hormones used in Women's Health Initiative because they were the dominant hormones being prescribed in the 90s when WHI was formulated. Um, I, I don't prescribe Premarin very often. It's a lot more expensive than that $4 a month estradiol, and I'm not sure it's better or, or safer, so I go, I go with the less expensive um, equivalent. But a lower dose of conjugated equine estrogen or Premarin um, has now been approved combined with a new serum, basidoxaphene, and it is, it is specifically marketed, approved by the FDA to treat hot flashes and to prevent osteoporosis in women with an intact uterus, which is to say no progestin. Um, do, we, do we know that basidoxaphene will have the same breast cancer prevention properties as tamoxifen and raloxifene? No, we do not know that. We might know that in 10 years. We certainly don't know now. We, we don't know it's safe or dangerous for that. Um, we do know it decreases mammographic breast density in menopausal users. That's encouraging, but that's a surrogate marker. That doesn't mean there's gonna be less breast cancer, but it's encouraging. Um, but for women with uh, a uterus, with symptomatic hot flashes who would like to take hormone therapy, would like to avoid a progestin for the reasons we've mentioned, this is a new option that is currently available. Okay. Well, since that, those scary headlines in 2002, there's been much market increase in non-hormonal treatment of menopausal symptoms. Um, and we have much better, because of that, we have much better data than we used to. So if you go to Walgreens or I guess GNC, um, you'll find, uh, what, one or two or three menopausal aisles um, and the, um, the um, woman behind the cash register who has no special knowledge will be happy to give you advice uh, um, on, on what are the best formulations. Uh, perhaps she graduated from high school. Um, and uh, so you may be told about soy or red clover isoflavones, black cohosh, Chinese herbs, I wish I could stand up here and say that these agents, now that they've been well studied, are more effective than hormone therapy because it would be great if, if these were effective options that were, didn't include hormone therapy. Unfortunately, they are not more effective than placebo now that we've done placebo-controlled trials. Okay, 
What about prescription agents? Um, things that our clinician can prescribe for us that uh, for hot flashes that are non-hormonal. Well, where do hormones come from? Excuse me, sorry. Where do hot flashes come from? What, what part of our body? Their brain, very good. And specifically, they come from a central organ in the brain known as the hypothalamus, located right near the pituitary, right above the pituitary. So it is a truism to say that any medication that is more effective than placebo in treating hot flashes is brain or central acting, CNS acting, and that is a true statement. And so notice that I'm mentioning on this slide several brain acting medications. Gabapentin, you might know as Neurontin. So what kind of doctors prescribe Neurontin or Gabapentin usually? Well, maybe shrinks. Careful, my dad was a shrink. Um, um, uh, but more likely pain management doctors and, and neurologists, chronic pain, it was originally marketed as an anti-convulsant, but now it's mostly pain man chronic pain. Okay, and then SSRIs, uh, the first one was, I guess, Prozac and Paroxetine, and the SNRIs, which are related, but a little bit different than SSRIs, which include Venlafoxine. Anybody know what the brand name is for that? Effects, right, effects are or Pristique, I guess, is desphenylfaxy. These all have some efficacy greater than placebo in treating hot flashes. The FDA, however, declined to approve the SNRIs or gabapentin recently, but the FDA did approve quite recently um, very low dose paroxetine. The lowest dose that we use for depression and anxiety is really 20 milligrams. It's available in 10 milligram um, formulations that we use to um, as initial therapy, and then we go up to 20 or higher. But it turns out a, a ultra-low-dose formulation is more effective. Unfortunately, not a lot more effective, but it's more effective than placebo in treating hot flashes, and it is FDA-approved. Um, and I do have some patients who use this medication, and, and some of them have been happy with it, but it is considerably less effective, unfortunately, than hormone therapy. Um, and it, it certainly has different side effects, too. Um, which patients need to be aware of. Um, and just a caveat, um, for women who are taking tamoxifen, they should not take SSRIs, they should not, including paroxetine, because the tamoxifen may become less effective. Okay, let's talk about cognitive issues briefly. Um, the findings initially from Women's Health Initiative were very frightening. Hormone therapy causes Alzheimer's disease, causes dementia. Well. In women age 65 and older who are in this WIM study, hormone therapy, or at least oral hormone therapy based with Premarin, with or without progestin, did accelerate dementia. Um, so it's, I think it's very clear that we should not prescribe hormone therapy to women age 65 or older to prevent dementia, or if we see early signs of dementia, that's, that we shouldn't do that. Um, and I don't think too many people do that, but if they're thinking about it, they shouldn't. What about um, hormone therapy? What was the effect of hormone therapy and women's health initiative in the clinically relevant group, women in the early 50s? No impact. I would, I would have loved to get up here and say, well, it prevented dementia. It, didn't, it also didn't cause any um, observable problems. And again, I think if there is a role for hormone therapy and cognitive function, it's in young women with induced menopause, like my index patient. And at the end of the talk, we'll follow up and, and describe how she's doing. Okay. Now let's, now let's start meandering from the general menopausal population and start moving in the direction of previvors um, and talk about induced menopause or early menopause. Okay, and there can be many reasons why menopause may occur early. Women's Health Initiative didn't look at women under 50, so it's not it doesn't inform us well here. Um, however, the message I'd like to leave you with, based on a number of studies cited here, is that in young women with um, menopause prior to age 50, um, th those women should take hormone therapy unless there's a specific reason not to. And we, we discussed this a bit at lunch, didn't we? Um, uh, and that, because without hormone therapy in this age group, we see elevated risk of um, neurodegenerative diseases, including dementia and even Parkinson's disease, elevated risk of cardiovascular problems, coronary artery disease, um, 
clearly osteoporosis, uh, obviously genital atrophy with, with sexual dysfunction. Okay. When we treat younger menopausal women, um, um, we need to recognize that we may, th these women may need higher doses um, than the spontaneously menopausal women in their 50s, sometimes twice as high a dose. Okay. Um, a healthcare professional came to me that, that um, um, a GYN oncologist had operated on, and she was in her 40s, she had uterine fibroids, and her, her normal ovaries were removed along with her fibroid uterus. Um, she, had to, she went on disability post-op. Um, she, she, did she have hot flashes and sleep disturbance? Yet, yes, but what was her big issue? Again, it was cognitive issues along with, mood, with depression. And he had started her on a conventional dose of hormone therapy, and it wasn't until about three months after we doubled, we gradually increased the dose until it was double what she had started that she was able to go back to work, and, now she, and she went back to work and was fine. But um, that, that educated me quite dramatically about um, younger menopausal women and dosing issues and, and some symptoms that we might not see in spontaneously menopausal women. Okay. Let's move on from brain to, um, to genital tract issues, the vulvovaginal atrophy, um, or what women may describe as vaginal dryness. Sometimes I, I hear Dr. Count, it's like a desert down there. Um, and there are a number of symptoms that can be associated with this. And, and very few of my patients are aware, I mean, many of my patients are aware of the sexual discomfort or dryness, but not many are aware that as, as genital atrophy progresses, um, women can start developing urinary urgency and recurrent UTIs, which can be very unpleasant and, uh, and even dangerous. Um, lots of different symptoms, I don't know how well you can see, uh, may accompany evolving genital atrophy. And, and it sort of sounds like I'm you know, being um, um, sarcastic like David Letterman or something, but you know, it's like there are two fundamental truths of menopause, and there really are. One is that hot flashes get better as menopausal women get older, but the, the less um, upbeat fundamental truth is that genital atrophy in untreated women gets worse. And unfortunately, that is true. It's not fair, but it's true. Um, on a little more upbeat note, but also true, I believe, is that if I was speaking to a group of 300 gentlemen out there in the audience, and I said, and I reminded them that um, sexual dysfunction was inevitable in untreated men and that they would lose one third of their external genital anatomy as they got older, but there was treatment available. How many men would sign up for that <laughs> treatment? Okay, but in fact, that's exactly the situation for women and yet most women and their physicians are terrified. Like we can't do that, that's hormones. So um, uh, that, that would not be the perspective I'd leave you with. Uh, unfortunately, the package labeling for vaginal estrogen is identical to that for systemic estrogen. So there's a black box and warnings from the Women's Health Initiative. Women's Health Initiative never studied vaginal estrogen. Um, it was like politically correct at the time that when, when uh, FDA slapped on this black box for, for Primarin and all hormone therapy, they did it for vaginal estrogen too as a convenient afterthought, I guess and millions of women, and I believe couples, have been harmed inappropriately, unnecessarily, by that decision. North American Menopause Society, uh, and I among them, are working to remove the black box for vaginal estrogen. Because it's like women come with this symptom, and they're, so, they're delighted that there's some effective treatment. Well, that's great. They go to Walgreens, they look at the black box, and they say, I'm not taking that. And um, that's, that's, um, it's misinformation. It's, um, it is doing a disservice to women. Treatments, behavioral treatments are important, particularly, and I'm not being sarcastic, the regular sexual activity part of behavioral therapy is actually important. Sometimes we see women with a par who are partnered, who are uh, maintaining regular sexual activity in their 60s or 70s, and they have very little evidence of genital atrophy um, on exam. Um, so it, it, it certainly is part of the treatment of, um, of symptomatic genital atrophy. Over-the-counter moisturizers. Moisturizers are not for sexual activity. Lubricants are, and that's an important distinction. And then the, um, the several types of prescription local or vaginal low-dose estrogen I've mentioned. Okay. Um, 
Uh, we've discussed the benefits of local estrogen already, but keep in mind that in contrast to a woman who's taking a tablet of estrogen or a patch of estrogen for hot flashes, women who are using vaginal estrogen only and have a uterus do not need to take progestin with it. Different, it's different than taking systemic. Here's the last new medication I'll mention, yet another. This is the fourth CIRM now available. Um, and how many of you have seen those um, attractive um, elder, uh, um, those attractive women in their 50s and 60s on TV recently? You, yep, yep. My wife and I, we say, well, gosh, they're actually saying the V word on prime time. Like, wow, uh, that's new. And, and that's a good thing. That gives women a more comfortable vocabulary to talk with clinicians about. Um, and ospemaphine is yet another CIRM. Uh, it is an oral agent, the only oral agent to treat um, a local genital atrophy concern. Uh, is it preferable to vaginal estrogen? I don't know, but it's nice to have new choices. And actually, I think the TV ads are great because it does increase awareness and does give women more of a vocabulary. It's going to have a different side effect profile than, um, than estrogens. And some women may be more comfortable or maybe some Oncologists may be more comfortable prescribing a CIRM, since they're very comfortable prescribing tamoxifen, than they are vaginal estrogen to some survivors or even previvors with symptomatic genital atrophy. It's, it's very early days. I've not even prescribed ospemaphine yet, but it is a new option I want you to be aware of. Um, reduced libido. If, genital, if vaginal dryness is the most common menopausal sexuality complaint, I think, I think right up there with it is loss of sexual desire. So let's talk more about that. Um, it's certainly very common in spontaneously or naturally menopausal women, but it is more prominent and more severe in surgically menopausal women, uh, as would apply to many women in this audience. Uh, it's, 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 it's a disgrace to women in some ways that, that uh, men, that there are all these agents for men that are available to treat male sexual dysfunction and we don't have anything for women. Uh, and I, I hear that complaint a lot and I think it's well founded. Uh, something to be aware of for women who are taking an SSRI and have the complaint of low sexuality is that the medication Wellbutrin or Bupropion, the generic can be at least a little bit helpful there. Um, I think we need to be aware that um, um, contextual issues, including relationship issues, are major um, drivers of sexuality in women, more so than in men. So if there is marital conflict, psychiatric concerns, history of sexual abuse, um, the, um, the prescription pad would not be the first step to address sexual dysfunction and probably um, referral and counseling would be the first step. Where I live in Jacksonville, um, we don't have any qualified credentialed sexual therapists and, um, and I think in bigger cities um, there's probably a lot more mental health resources available. So what about androgens and specifically testosterone? They're important to female sexuality, guess they are as, as they are to males, although um, they work at lower doses in women. We mentioned that unlike estrogen and progestin, which declines abruptly in, in spontaneously menopausal women, early 50s, um, pr uh, the decline in ovarian androgen production occurs earlier and is more gradual. Um, and certainly um, it's normal for, um, not necessarily fair, but normal for women as they age to experience the um, sexuality changes that I've detailed in bullet number three. Um, and so when, for women who are concerned about loss of desire, loss of, of orgasmic function or arousal, if they're to take testosterone, and we'll, we'll discuss, and I'm sure there'll be questions about the practical issues surrounding testosterone treatment in women, and there are many practical concerns, unfortunately. But, what, but I do often use this automotive analogy, and I guess first I should say I'll, I'll use a meteorologic analogy too. I say, well, unfortunately, uh, if you start testosterone, it's not gonna be a category five hurricane. And in, in Florida, women know about, about hurricanes and their categories. Um, and then, I mean, then I also use the automotive analogy. I say, well, right now you probably feel like you have an old um, Rambler or an, uh, an old Ford Taurus stuck in a dark garage with the garage door closed. And I say, well, 
if you start testosterone, I'm not going to be able to get you onto um, interstate doing 75, um, attracting the attention of the law enforcement, but maybe I can get you to a side road, at least doing 30, 35. And, and patients invariably say, well, that would be fine. You know, that would be fine. Um, so, and, and, and there's a lot of truth in that automotive analogy. Okay, so what's available in terms of testosterone? There is one old formulation um, that combines oral estrogen and uh, oral methyl testosterone, available in two doses, um, that I sometimes prescribe, and some women benefit from in terms of sexuality issues. Uh, we want to be aware of that. Um, of course, if women have a uterus, they, they'll also need a progestin for endometrial protection. There are implantable and injectable um, of testosterone. The implantable is that is from our friends down the street, the, the compounding pharmacists again, not FDA approved, I wouldn't recommend it. Injectables are FDA approved, but they're dosed for men. I wouldn't, we know nothing about the safety in women. Um, compounded, again, uh, are also available in creams and gels as well as implants. Uh, you've, you've heard my concerns there. There are FDA, the good news, there are FDA approved testosterone formulations, and we see these on TV a lot, right? Do you have low T? Um, you've seen those ads, but who are they targeting? Men. Right, there are no testosterone formulations approved for women, which is not right. There is a testosterone patch. We, did, we participated in the clinical trial. Um, Procter & Gamble um, developed this. It is available for women with induced menopause in Europe, but we'll, let's talk about its history in, in the US. Some of you are, who are old enough to remember 10 years ago might remember this headline from USA Today. The testosterone patch, it was looking good. There's a lot of media interest. Thumbs down. It got um, the cardiologist, Dr. Nissen, who you'll often see quoted on FDA regulatory issues, said we need more safety data, and it never got approved. And so there is no testosterone approved for women. In the last slides, I want to focus on what do we know about use of hormones among the previvor community, and then we'll also talk about survivors where we have much less information. So um, we know that in practice, some previvors who undergo risk-reducing GYN surgery will choose to use hormone therapy, at least sh short-term. Others don't. Um, some women may delay risk-reducing surgery because of concerns about using post-operative hormone therapy and also concerns um, uh, relative to breast cancer risk. And if these women have an intact uterus and would also need progestin, these concerns are going to be greater. Okay, let's talk about three um, or two published articles, but three, three uh, sets of data that specifically address this issue. The fir first comes from Dr. Rebick right here, uh, who's well known in the uh, area of investigation with um, the BRCA community. He's, uh, he's one of Dr. Domchek's colleagues right here at University of Pennsylvania in this city. Um, he studied uh, more than 450 previvors uh, in, in this collaborative um, um, uh, study. Um, these women had intact breasts. They were previvors. Um, they were, um, the hormone users were followed from on average three to four years. And uh, there's more descriptions in these sub-bullets at the bottom of this slide. So what did he find with his collaborators? He found that um, that risk-reducing GYN surgery, removing of the t removal of the tubes and ovaries, reduced breast cancer risk, not just ovarian cancer risk, but breast cancer risk, whether or not women used hormone therapy. And, and he concluded um, that short-term use of hormone therapy does not negate the protection offered by uh, removal of tubes and ovaries in previvors. Okay. Second study from Dr. Eisen, uh, again well known in, in, the, um, in studying um, previvors, was published in 2008 in the Journal of National Cancer Institute. Again, uh, more than 450, um, this time just BRCA carriers, BRCA1. Um, half of these women had been diagnosed with breast cancer, half were controls who had not been diagnosed with breast cancer. Some cases and some controls had previously used hormone therapy. Overall, um, use of hormone therapy was associated, it sounds counterintuitive, with a, 40, with a greater than 40% reduction in risk of breast cancer. 
And this um, protection against breast cancer, again, it's, it almost seems strange saying that, this, this, were, this was their findings, uh, was noted regardless of prior risk-reducing GYN surgery. And then the most recent data set, and probably the most important, um, not yet published, but I talked with Dr. Domchek this morning, right after her remarks um, in this room, and she said it, she, will, she intends on publishing it. Yes, I should present this slide, and yes, she still believes in this data. So this was almost 1,300 um, carriers of, of mutations who underwent uh, BSO um, um, at mean age in their early 40s. Um, and, um, uh, and then you can see the women, uh, the women who didn't use hormone therapy, their mean age was 45. These women were previvors. They had intact breasts. Um, the follow-up was, uh, on average, five to six years. So what were her findings? Hormone therapy use, whether EPT or E only, following salpingoophorectomy was not associated with an elevated risk of breast cancer. Again, regardless of prior um, of BSO. Uh, in, in BRCA1 carriers, use of hormone therapy was associated, as Dr. Eisen's group found, with uh, um, counterintuitive, but this is their findings, a decreased risk of breast cancer, regardless of um, presence or absence of tubes and ovaries. And, that, and Dr. Domchek says she will be publishing this eventually. Her comment to me was, was eye-opening. Um, she said, uh, Andy, my perspective, and that she um, encouraged me to share this with you, that in the community of previvors, hormone therapy is grossly underutilized, to, to quote what she said earlier today in this room. Okay. Um, what about, um, what are the surgical options, and what are the hormone therapy options for previvors who are thinking about surgery? They could have removal of tubes and ovaries alone with estrogen and progestin replacement. They could have hysterectomy along with removal of tubes and ovaries followed by estrogen alone. Or they could have gynecologic surgery with or without hysterectomy with no hormone therapy postoperatively. So these are all options. And I imagine there are women in this room who've, who've elected all three of these options. Okay. One woman I talked to today mentioned that she has several sisters, all carriers, and each one of them has chosen a, a distinct path in terms of their preferences regarding risk-reducing surgery. Okay. So should salpingoephrectomy be accompanied by hysterectomy? Uh, what's my perspective as a gynecologist? Uh, um, oncologists may have their own perspective. Um, um, I think most importantly, having a hysterectomy along with risk-reducing removal of tubes and ovaries allows a previvor to use estrogen alone. And we know that in the general community, using estrogen alone is not only safe, but, the, but reduces, reduces breast cancer incidence and mortality. Um, we also know that some women who are breast cancer survivors, um, as well as some previvors, may use tamoxifen in terms of for, for breast health issues. We know that tamoxifen increases uterine cancer risk. If there's no uterus, there's no uterine cancer risk. So those are some of the reasons to consider hysterectomy, but there are disadvantages of hysterectomy as well. It's not a slam dunk decision. Um, there's, it's more surgery to have the uterus out along with tubes and ovaries. There's more recovery. There's more complications. The good news is that in the hands of a skilled, and I'll emphasize skilled, minimally invasive GYN surgeon, um, the risks and the recovery associated with hysterectomy have declined in recent years. I think, that, I think there are less benefits to, um, of hysterectomy in women who are not going to be interested in use of hormone either way. They're, or perhaps they're already menopausal. Um, they're not symptomatic. They're not, hormone therapy is not relevant for them. Or perhaps they're breast cancer survivors and hormone therapy is not relevant to them. So hysterectomy may be less, uh, less, um, less of a, an, an appealing option in that setting. Okay, so the, the, the concluding comments I'd like to leave you with regarding hormone therapy um, and the setting of um, uh, being a previvor, um, perhaps having had risk-reducing GYN surgery. 
I don't think pre previvirs need to avoid risk reducing salpingoophorectomy due to fears about the menopausal symptoms that may follow. Um, I think we can recognize that short term with, with in terms of several years, three to five years of hormone therapy, clearly I think we could say this is safe. Um, we know less about longer term therapy, although Dr. Domchek's data um, does provide some reassurance there. And that hysterectomy may be, may be appropriate to accompany removal of tubes and ovaries in some previvors, but not in all. I think it's a very individualized choice, and I hope I've shed a little bit of light on what may help in making decisions. Okay, so back to my patient who got me involved with FORCE. Um, she's doing very well um, she, uh, on her um, estrogen therapy. She has no hot flashes or vaginal symptoms, but she didn't, she sort of thought it was a little expensive using patches and also using vaginal estrogen. And by the way, there's no generic vaginal estrogen. There's no $4 a month Walmart vaginal estrogen. It's, it's all full copay, unfortunately. Um, so she said, well, is there any way I can guess consolidate this into one treatment? And remember, there is a systemic vaginal ring. There's a local vaginal ring, S ring, but there's a systemic vaginal ring that treats hot flashes, prevents osteoporosis, and addresses genital atrophy. It's called fem ring, and she's on that and doing very well. Um, um, over the years, uh, we're going to consider reducing her dose of estrogen therapy at some point, stopping it. This will be her decision, not mine. Uh, she hasn't, she does have some concerns about um, testosterone, um, uh, and so despite having some uh, low sexual desire, she hasn't gone there by addressing general atrophy concerns that did help with her sexuality issues, at least to some degree. And um, I'm seeing in the audience people are saying, what about her cognitive concerns? And yes, they, they, they perked up quite rapidly after she initiated um, the estrogen patch and have, have, maintained, have continued to be uh, improved. 